all start by acknowledging Cynthia for the beautiful presentation she had earlier on. And uh, I'll be following up on that presentation. The title of my presentation is The Future is Here. But I quip, really? And why do I quip? Let's define what we mean by the computer age. The computer age is the age in which computers take over some of the things that we've been doing up till now. And I chose those words carefully. Uh, it's actually, it, it's, it's, it, it's encrypted. But Ronnie Rosenfeld, one of the AI aficionados in Carnegie Mellon University said that the computer age will truly arrive when computers learn to deal with us humans on our own terms. And what does this mean? He added that for computers to deal with us on our own terms, we must realize what he describes as the silk technologies. And he describes the silk technologies as the technologies of speech, technology of image, technology of language, and technology of knowledge. Technology of speech is the type of technology that makes it possible for you to speak to the computer and the computer turns what you've said into writing or you present uh, written text to the computer and the computer turns that into speech for you. The technology of image, you present a spade to a computer and the computer says, yes, it is a spade is a spade. Recognizes that it's a spade and not a spoon. Technology of, knowledge, uh, of uh, language is the technology that makes the computer understand what is written in natural language. And the technology of knowledge is what we all call AI, the technology that makes it possible for the computer to be able to think, the computer to be able to reason, the computer to be able to create information out, uh, unknown information out of known information. It is suggested that the biggest breakthrough in technology these days will come when computers are able to deal with human language at about the mid level that we human are able to deal with it. And it is predicted that when that happens in retail, automation in retail will go from 53% to about 60%. And we had a bit of that earlier on from the presentation on AI, that in the area of finance and insurance, automation will go from about 43% to about 66%. And that's, these are the kind of developments we expect from these technologies. In order to look at this in depth, let's ask ourselves, what is this information revolution we talk about? To start with, let's start with what is information? Some people have defined information as patterns that represent reality. I put there is a tree stump. If you look at that tree stump, you see rings. You see rings in the tree stump. That is a pattern. Do you know what that pattern means? It tells you how old the tree is when it was cut. Because every season, every cycle of season, that ring, one ring is created. So that pattern provides you information. And what do we do with information? We use the information to make decisions and take actions. The reason why you are here is because you got the information that something is going on here today. Now, what about the information revolution that we talk about? A revolution fundamentally is a change of high intensity and fast pace. So when we talk of the information revolution, we are saying that the value of information is increasing at a very fast rate with high intensity. We then talk of the information age, which is a new age that presents us a totally new way of making tools. And why do I say this? Human beings have been making tools for close to two million years. 
But for the first time in human history, we've made a tool whose use is determined not by the maker, but by the user. And that's the computer. And this is because the hardware of the computer is different from the software of the computer. And we have this tool now that the use is determined by the user and not the maker. Let's look a bit of computer history to put all this in context. When computers came, when computers came, they were found in highly specialized environments and used by very, very clever people. And in that time, computers were found only in computer centers and you had to take yourself to the computer center to use the computer. At that time, computer skills were specialized skills. Computer skills were specialized skills, and only highly specialized people used computers. But then the computer made a transition from those highly specialized environments onto the desks of professionals. They became tools used by professionals, and at that point, computer skills became professional skills. That's when you go for an interview to be an accountant, they ask you, uh, can you use spreadsheets today? You're not even asked, it's assumed. But next, the computer moved out of those professional environments. They are now on the streets. They are used for everything and anything. They are used everywhere and anywhere. And for that, computer skills have now become life skills. They are skills that everybody needs. The computer are now on the streets. They are no more in computer centers. They are no more merely on the desk of professionals. They are on the streets, and computer skills have become life skills. And you'll find that at that point, anybody that does not have these computer skills will be living at the periphery of the information age. Because the information, uh, the periphery of the information society, because the information society is a society in which it is information that determines what happens. And this is a very typical scene that I see once, once in a while when I go to use an ATM. Uh, because somebody doesn't have the computer skill to use the ATM, then they ask their neighbor, please, can you help me in, uh, find out, uh, get money out? They say, my number is this. And that's what you refer to as a personal ident identification number you are revealing to a total stranger. That's the kind of thing that happens when you live at the periphery of the information age. I said earlier on that the computer is a unique tool in the sense that it's a general purpose hardware that is controlled by software. Now, if a general purpose hardware is controlled by software, then there's a need to instruct it. The question then is in what language? In what language do you instruct it? Maybe I should quickly say here that language is a fundamentally humanizing factor. What do I mean by this? The use of language to communicate complex ideas and convoluted thoughts is a sole preserve of human beings. That's what distinguishes human beings from lower animals, one of the major distinctions. So anybody that does not have the capacity to operate at that level of language unfortunately has taken a step down to the level of lower animals. And I put here these two quotations, you speak to me in your language and I hear you in mine. And each time somebody speaks to you in their language, believe it or not, you are hearing them in your language. And that's why you say things like give them 10, 10 naira. You just translate them from one naira mewa mewa to English. The English won't say that, they say give them 10 naira each. So that's the, then the next thing is if you speak your language to somebody, if you speak a language that somebody understands to them, you are speaking to their head. But if you speak to them, their language, you are speaking to their heart. And if you don't believe me, go to the market and speak to somebody selling in his or her language, you get the way cheaper. And that's the kind of thing that happens with language. Now what I have here is the 
Human Development Index of 71 Asian, African, and Southern American countries randomly arranged according to the names of the country. And if you look at it, you don't really see much distinction. You just see a group of dots. That's, uh, but when you look at this, you see a clear distinction between the countries on the left and countries on the right. And you do not need to guess much. The countries on the left are those countries that teach their children in foreign languages. And the countries on the right are the countries that teach their children in their local languages. What does this mean? What is the Human Development Index? The Human Development Index is a vector of various indices, include maternal mortality, child mortality, level of literacy, and on and on and on like, like that. So in essence, what we are saying is that if you teach your children in a foreign language, you have more women than a childbirth. If you teach your children in a foreign language, you have more children dying before the age of six. What's the connection? If you don't have information, you are vulnerable. And that is not, that is what existing data says. That's what the data around us uh, say. Now, for development to happen, you need development agents. And we are the development agents. The people are the development agents in any country. The problem, though, is that those of you here that I assume are development agents, sorry, you are in the minority. Those of you who have the capacity to speak English, you have the capacity to read and write, you are in the minority. So what happens is that you are bearing the development needs of everybody else. Because English is the language of officialdom, English is the language of education, English is the language of opportunities. So once you can't speak English, you don't have access to all these things. And that is part of why we are not making much, uh, uh, prog uh, much progress. Now, the objective of my presentation is that it takes only one generation to make computers understand our languages, speak in our languages, work in our languages. But it takes forever because you have to teach every generation to speak English. And we've been doing this for over a hundred years and we don't seem to have achieved much. Do you remember that around 1998, we had only 500,000 telephone lines in Nigeria. Today we have over 160 million, and that is because the telephone does not demand of you ability to speak English, neither does it demand of you the ability to read and write. That is the only technology that has had that level of development because the barrier that language places there is not there. So for us, the choice is ours, whether we're going to continue to struggle to make our children speak English in order to live useful lives, or we're going to take the advantage presented by ICT and for one, just for one, within one generation, make ICTs work in our local languages and we'll be able to make progress. I work for Africa language, African Languages Technology Initiative, Alt-I, and what we do is we make computers usable in African languages. Towards making computers deal with us, Nigerians and Africans, in, on our own terms, we have created keyboards for Nigerian languages so that you can type on computer keyboards in Nigerian languages. We have um, uh, localized Microsoft, Office, uh, Microsoft Windows and Office Suite from Microsoft Vista 
all the way to uh, uh, Microsoft um, 10, Windows 10, in Hausa, Igbo, and Yoruba, in partnership with Microsoft, we've created automatic speech recognition software for Yoruba so that when you speak Yoruba to the computer, it writes what you have said. We've created, thank you, we've created speech synthesis software that when you present written text to the computer, it can read it to you in Yoruba. We've created spell checkers in both Hausa and Yoruba for open office. We've uh, created automatic stemming for the Igbo language. Stemming is what makes it possible for you to search for boys and the computer will still recognize boy. You search for words and the computer is able to go to the root of the words and search. So that is what stemming is. We have um, done work modeling five dialects of the English language spoken in West Africa. So if you present any written material to that computer system, it can tell you whether it is written by a Cameroonian, a Nigerian, a Sierra Leonean, a Ghanaian, or a Liberian. And why did we do that? Many years ago, we had a minister of information that was going around campaigning about Nigeria, uh, Nweke Jr. And one of the major battles he was fighting at that point is that this thing they call 419 letters do not come only from Nigeria. And one of my students then was working on that problem and was trying to trace IP addresses and all that. And of course, you know, you can mask your IP address, but one thing you cannot ma mask is your language. So what we did then was to build models of these various languages, and we were able to make distinctions. And this is not spoken English, written English. If a material is written, we can tell you which of the five West African countries the person who wrote it comes from, or whether it doesn't belong to any of these uh, languages. The core of our work is what we call redefining literacy. We seek to change the definition of literacy from the ability to read and write to the capacity to interact with literature. Because when you can speak and the computer writes what you've said, you can present written text to the computer and it reads it, can you still say the person who is sitting behind the computer is illiterate? And we say this, that we are using this to take people from illiteracy to e-literacy, making them literate by electronic means. Of course, there are lots and lots and lots to do, and we just want to invite you to be part of this uh, journey because the future of our country, the future of ourselves depends on us. And let me just warn you, you cannot depend on technology transfer for human language technology. Because from where do you want to transfer Igbo technology to Enugu? From Copenhagen? So we, it is us that have to do it. Join us. Thank you very much.